And if you're watching this on a recording, thanks for watching the recording. Uh, I PVR most TV stuff too, so it's all good. Um, what we're really here to talk about today is um, I'm, I'm pretty sick of webinars. I'm pretty sick of hearing about YouTube and Amazon and Tesla and Facebook and Shopify, like these, these huge companies. Um, they, have, they have more resources and people than any startup has. So a lot of the strategies that I see coming up from them are great strategies for huge companies, but they're not really strategies that are kind of viable for startups that are kind of working out of their garage or um and that's another another annoyance i have i know i'm wearing a linkedin golf shirt right now um i know linkedin always puts out a top startups uh canadian startups every year i think it was wealth simple rebecca if i'm not wrong um that won i think two of the last three years they've got more money than than i'll ever see in my life like i think it's like 300 million in the bank they've got 500 employees that's not a startup that's that's a fully baked company um that has done a great job of growing but the stuff that we're really trying to drive home for, for everyone today is actual tactical strategies that you can implement when you don't have all of the resources and people and time in the world. So there, there's certainly a bias here. This is more geared towards foundational stuff that you as uh, startup C-levels, HR pros uh, can easily implement in your organization and really make hiring uh, easier or hiring simplified. Um, just to give you a, a brief synopsis of who I am, uh, I'm, I'm John. Um, you'll find me online everywhere at Big Tall John. My last name's a nightmare. I'm 6'7". Uh, I've been eating a lot of pizza and cheese during the pandemic, so I'm up to about 245 now. Um, but the whole idea, I grew up in the agency world. Um, I was an early adopter of LinkedIn. Um, really started to see the value of building digital relationships and amplifying messages uh, through people um, that really helped uh, my former organization scale. Um, I kind of got sick of the agency world. I think it was 2010, maybe. Um, it was a it was a like an early days employer branding, recruitment, marketing consultant for a few years, uh, just on my own, and really got sick of running a business out of a 600 square foot condo in Hamilton. Um, and ultimately got picked up by uh, a pre-IPO HR tech startup uh, in Ottawa, Halogen Software and was able to help them scale from 170, one office to uh, publicly traded 11 offices, seven countries, four continents, 500, I think it was 530-ish employees uh, in three years. And I got to travel everywhere. So I was basically living out of a, a suitcase for a long time uh, and I loved it, um, but got to see you know, the, the, the balance of how do you implement the more creative strategies within a corporate environment and how can you really scale those strategies by engaging your employees? Um, a huge LinkedIn fanboy for years, for sure. Um, and I remember I was spending, I think it was like a, a buck 25 or 150 a year on the LinkedIn products. Um, but through things like employee advocacy and brand and marketing, we were able to cut that spend down to almost nothing. Um, and that pissed off LinkedIn, but it was great for us uh, overall. So what you'll hear from me is a lot of tactical stuff that works. Uh, my bias is on the free before the paid, um, but certainly uh, there, there comes a time where you do need to kind of put some chips in the middle of the table to, to unlock different resources. So the, the whole idea of, of um, how we run webinars here, um, a little different, and I'm already screwing it up, Rebecca, <clears throat> Where is my little thing to launch the poll? You're, you have to share your screen as well, John. Oh, hell. Great start. How's that? There you go. Okay, so the whole, whole idea, we run webinars a little bit differently than uh, most companies. The webinars are, are typically dry. They're typically people kind of reading off a screen. Um, and what what we're all about is really engaging people in conversation. So um, what I'm really curious of is, is for everyone in attendance, uh, is this the first time that you're attending one of our events or have you, have you seen us before? Have you, um, Eric, I know you mentioned that we, we, we met up in Toronto a couple of years back. Um, I just wanna get a gauge of, of um, what we're expecting sort of thing. Okay, yes, I loved it. Thank you, those two people. Rebecca, you must have written this question. No, but now I have FOMO. Yes, that's all me. <laughs> Amazing. And we've got a bunch of folks new. Okay, I'm just going to close this out. It looks like most people have voted already. 
So we've got a lot of new folks um, here. I'm still share the results here. Most folks here are uh, new to it. So the whole idea is if you have questions, just raise your hand, uh, add it in the chat, and let's address those questions straight away. Um, I have probably 15 to 20 minutes of planned talk. Uh, but what I find is what really makes these events fun and, and, and um, educational and, and things where you can actually apply different uh, strategies, et cetera, uh, is through conversation. So if you have uh, any comments, questions, concerns, you name it, uh, put it in the chat straight away. Rebecca will uh, tell me to shout up and we can address them uh, as we go. Um, what we're really going to talk about today, there's a, there's a, a five core elements. Um, certainly, um, how to implement your employer brand is a big one. Um, Pivot and Edge is not a recruiting agency that sells people. We don't charge percentage-based fees. We don't do any of the stuff that, that kind of turns everyone off of recruiters in general. Uh, and the foundation of how we can do that and why we do that is really fundamentally, we believe it's more important to help organizations attract people to them as opposed to convince folks to join them. Um, so we'll go through a bunch of different steps on you know, what can you do for your organization to really uh, implement and activate your employer brand? Um, and the, the, the most obvious sort of offshoot of an employer brand is the job posting. Um, I think everyone in the room, I was going through the, um, uh, the, the list of attendees or, or registrants. It seems like most people that are attending are either the sole HR person or one of the C-levels uh, of the company. Um, I think for the HR folks, you'll all kind of agree that there, there's a difference between a job description and a job posting. Um, the main one being the description is an HR document, the posting is more of an advertisement. So we'll kind of go through some, some different um, uh, steps where you can really maximize your overall efficiency in terms of your overall message. Um, getting into, um, you know, you, you, you've got your brand, you've got your posting, you now have candidates coming into the funnel. Um, I, I love and hate interviewing in the sense that um, tons of folks think they're, they're great at interviewing and most are terrible. Um, so we've all seen and read those stories about, you know, how much would it cost to wash all of the windows in New York City style of questions. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of those myself, but um, go through some techniques for how to actually conduct efficient interviews um, that unveil the objective traits and qualities and candidates that, that we really need. Uh, to see, uh, just to avoid uh, poor hiring in general. Um, one thing I, I always uh, enjoy doing is the pre-close. So you've interviewed the candidate now, how do you make sure you win them at the offer stage? So we, we've developed some process and tech and, and, and uh, steps to take to really increase your overall uh, offer acceptance efficiency. And especially in the, the startup world, if you've committed I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, probably five hours of time evaluating candidates and all that kind of stuff. The, the last thing you want to do is lose them at the finish line. So we'll go through some, uh, some techniques around uh, winning more at the offer stage. And then onboarding. Onboarding is always a fun one. Uh, we have a new, uh, new uh, person joining our team on Monday. Uh, and I think, Rebecca, we've had, I think in the last three months, I think we've had five or six folks to the team. Um, yes. And I think our onboarding process at Pivot and Edge has been a progressively better one in the sense that I think it was um, April of last year, the whole team was only four and now it's 14. And so when we onboarded employee number five back in, I don't know, August, maybe uh, that onboarding process was a mess. Like I, I was off for a bike trip like the next day for 10 days. She basically was a sink or swim scenario. Like, here's the tools. Here's the tech. I'll talk to you in two weeks. Good luck. Uh, and now we actually have a more structured uh, process to really help ensure folks get onboarded uh, in, in, a, in a good way, because the first impressions make a, make a big difference, that sort of thing. Um, so that's the core stuff that's on the agenda. Um, moving in, I know Career Builder is a, a bit dated, but in general, um, I, think, I think we all can accept now that social proof and having ability to uncover information it makes a big impact to how we make decisions on, do I want to order this for dinner? Do I want to go there for vacation? Do I want to apply to this job at this company? Um, and it looks like a, a, a good proportion of the, the candidate base, but a third, uh, are willing to move on to a new opening if they can't find information about the company. Um, and so 
being in this candidate driven market where we're now competing with organizations in the states that are knocking on our employees doors and offering them a pile of money to work remote from Canada. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to compete because before uh, we were just competing with our talent rivals within our commutable radius. And now we're literally competing with the whole world. Um, so one of the big things about branding and, and employer branding in general is making sure that you have an appropriate amount of information that, that really speaks to your ideal talent audience. And, and if you don't, there's a big risk that you're going to uh, lose out to folks just because they don't know who you are. And, and that really leads into uh, managing your overall online presence. Um, and that's not just your careers page. That's not just your LinkedIn profile. Um, that's not just your job postings in general. Um, it's something where if you view your employer brand uh, similar to how your organization views its uh, organizational brand, the big thing is having consistency in the message and know who you're speaking to or know who you want to get the attention of. And that, the, the, the very first thing that I think all of you likely have or should pay attention to is your careers page. Um, now, one thing I'm really curious of, and maybe, maybe just toss your answers in the chat. I don't want to put another poll up right now. Um, how, like, when was the last time people have updated their careers page? Like, have folks updated their careers page since? Oh, actually, we do this as a poll, Rebecca, don't we? We do. Yeah. Um, COVID has been uh, awful for everyone. Um, but what about what we've done with our careers page in, say, the last six months or so? Like, have we updated it? Have we not updated it? Do we still have photos of, uh, you know, different team lunches, that kind of stuff? Boats are coming in, outstanding. Never. Who's saying never? We also have a comment uh, in the chat. Um, Michaela said that she had done it in the last three months, so a little bit oh. sooner. Yeah. Okay. What about the last year? Who said the last year? Because that's really interesting. Because if it was actually 12 months ago, that would be like just at the beginning of the pandemic. Okay, six months. Lots of folks here. Okay, cool. So it looks as though most people have, well, not most, half have updated in the last six months. The other half, it's either never or the last year. Um, we Update. also had a comment. Oh, sorry, John. We just had a comment come in as well that she has a um, Samantha has a client that she works with that does not have one, but she's really pushing for them to have one at all. Got it. Okay, we can address that too. Um, so one thing I'm really curious of, and I, I have conversations like this every day. Um, there was um, a commentary with a client yesterday that they don't really have a lot of team photos, um, especially since the pandemic started. So. What sort of information should I include on my careers page? What sort of imagery should I include on our careers page? That kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that, that pretty much everyone here has been living on Zoom or Teams or some sort of video uh, service for the last 18 months or so. Um, this a screenshot here is from a, a company out of Toronto called Broker Bay. Um, and they had that exact same scenario. They had a few photos of, of being on a boat in Toronto and the office that they just rented and all that kind of stuff. Um, but how do we kind of tell the visual story of what we've done because of the pandemic and our transition to work from home, et cetera. Um, so this image here is just a, not the whole team, but it's a good chunk of the team uh, just on a video call with some sort of, I think that's the heart symbol. Um, this is the kind of stuff that's really, really easy to put together that doesn't require a lot of time. Um, so updating your careers page, you certainly want to talk about, you know, what are your core values as a company? What's in it for the candidate? Why should they join? Um, but having an image like this one, straight away, I'm assuming this is a remote work kind of company. Um, if you see that imagery, uh, the five folks or the half the folks that said they haven't updated it or they don't have it, uh, if the bias is to include uh, legacy photos of what you used to be versus what you are today, a simple solution is really just acknowledging that, that, that COVID exists. Uh, acknowledge that there's been a transition and people are working from home and this is the new reality. Um, so when it comes to career page, pages in general, um, certainly you want to have imagery that kind of inspires like a welcoming feeling. Um, you want to showcase, if you have diversity, you want to showcase that as best you can. 
um, and acknowledge the work environment stuff as best you can as well. So um, right now, uh, the whole flexibility, um, you know, working from wherever, it's, it's no longer a nice to have, it's kind of an expectation. So as you're looking at your careers page, really think about how has working at ABC company changed because of the pandemic? And then how can you capture that information through your careers page, either through imagery or uh, text uh, and, and some stories? Um, that was the poll that we just ran. Uh, Rebecca, let's talk about review management. Um, there, there's more than just Glassdoor now. There's Google, there's Indeed, there's all that kind of stuff. Um, when you were looking at Pivot and Edge, Rebecca, as a, as a potential option, I'm assuming you went to Glassdoor and, and wanted to check out some inside information. Is that fair? Yes, it's, I, I'm a review hound. I do it with all the restaurants I go to, any, any tourist destination, and specifically when I'm looking for, for new career opportunities, for sure. Do you? So you said you're a, a review hound. Do you look at Glassdoor when choosing restaurants as well? Not Glassdoor, but Google is my go-to. Yep. Uh, for for reviews, but uh, Glassdoor, I mean, it's a good, uh, solid one for especially for recruit, like for job seekers. Uh, in general, yeah. So Glassdoor, when it first came out, um, I thought it was terrible. I thought it was just a place where people went to vent and complain and, and trash their former employer. Um, but over the years, my opinion on Glassdoor has changed a lot. Now I know the company that owns Indeed also owns Glassdoor, so there's a lot of kind of usability challenges right now and, and they're doing their best to make as much money as they can. So it makes it a little bit difficult to unlock the same capabilities that we used to be able to for free, but um, managing Glassdoor reviews is super important. So um, I think Rebecca, we, we had some resources on that if you want to toss that in the chat. Um, yep, that it's, it's totally going to happen that your company is going to receive a bad review at some point. Like don't, don't uh, concern yourself over it's never going to happen. It's going to happen at some point. Um, and I get a lot of questions from CEOs. Uh, you know, what, how do I respond? What do I say? This review is total nonsense. Like the person uh, is upset because we fired them or whatever. Um, what I find, and at the same time, there's other reviews where um, there's tons of companies out there that are actually encouraging their town acquisition team to post positive reviews just to kind of bury the old ones. Um, what I find as a gross generalization is acknowledging the review, uh, no matter if it's good or bad, is the most important thing. Um, now, if it's a scathing review, if it's a negative review, a one star out of five sort of scenario, uh, or like a five star out of five, I think it's, it's my, my impression at least is no company is perfect and no company is truly terrible. Um, the ones that are in that two, three, four star range are the ones that I kind of view as more relevant, more practical, more reasonable. Um, but you don't necessarily want to go and be overly enthusiastic and thank someone for a five star review when the obvious perception is that it could be fake in the first place. At the same time, if it's a one star review and they say a bunch of terrible things, you don't necessarily want to get defensive about that either because someone did leave the review, whether it be their genuine feeling or it was some sort of personal attack. Um, so I do tend to su suggest to companies in general, uh, when you're looking at your glass door reviews specifically, or even indeed as well, kind of be the wet blanket and just acknowledge it. Uh, if there's something specific there, then address it. But otherwise, if it's a negative one, say something like, you know, appreciate your feedback. Um, wasn't the the experience that we uh, uh, tried to provide our employees. If you want to reach out and give me any specifics, here's my phone number, here's my email, that kind of thing. Same thing for the positive ones. Um, thanks for your feedback. Appreciate it. Uh, if you want to provide any feedback, here's my phone number, here's my email, et cetera. Um, and that way, what you're really showing your audience is more that you're paying attention and less that you're trying to farm more good reviews or very bad ones. Um, Rebecca, I see there's a couple more things in the chat. Is there anything that we want to address? Yeah, no, uh, Michaela and Donna are agreeing with you. It's They value how the employer responds to reviews on Glassdoor versus the review itself. So to your point. Got it. Awesome. And when, when you're a startup, um, you probably don't have, like Rebecca, when you look at a restaurant, what's, what's the lowest sort of credible number of reviews that you look at a restaurant for? Like if you want to go to, I don't know, New York and have tacos, if someone had three reviews, would that be the same weight as a thousand? I mean, the the number of reviews is challenging. Either they're new, um, which you know could be a potential, uh, or 
they just don't own the profile, so they're not managing it, so people aren't using it. Uh, there's a couple of variations, but when it comes to startup, I mean, it's one of those things that um, we can't forget about it in the process of growing. Yep, and that's when when you are a startup and you are a small company, you're not going to have 100 reviews, and you probably don't even have a practical ability to get 100 reviews until you've had probably 300 employees. Um, but uh, if you are having one-on-ones with your employees, especially when you are early stage, there's nothing wrong with letting your employees know that uh, their feedback is important and people are researching ABC company. And if you have any, any feedback you'd like to share, there is a mechanism for it and you're welcome to do it sort of thing. So definitely you don't want to create fake ones. Um, you don't want to combat negative ones, but certainly creating an environment where people feel comfortable uh, giving their feedback, it makes a big difference because people look at reviews as they're deciding on places, either should I apply, interview, or accept an offer from sort of thing. I see something in the Q&A just popped up, Rebecca. Yes, they're just agreeing with you. They're looking that, that the CEO takes ownership of the profile and et cetera, so. Got it. Um, social media, everyone's favorite uh, pastime these days. This is no longer a nice to have. This is an absolute requirement. Um, the, the image here just shows some examples of, of different things that you can do, what to include, um, calls to action, backlinks, you name it. Um, right now, uh, this one is with uh, Haloti Robotics. Um, I don't know if you've seen the show Black Mirror, but they're legitimately bringing humanoid robots to the world and it's cool and creepy at the same time. Um, in, in this case, their target audience is very much centered around uh, full stack roboticists, people that have been involved with VR, um, really high level programming, that kind of stuff. In this case, it makes sense to uh, post on LinkedIn. Now, if you're a company that is hiring for a skill set that is not necessarily on LinkedIn, say for example, um, there's all sorts of different uh, Uber style companies now, uh, last mile delivery, you know, things where you're relying on the crowd to um, uh, fulfill more tactical roles. LinkedIn is probably not your spot. Um, the biggest thing I encourage you to think about is uh, where does my ideal candidate live, work, and play? And what are their digital habits? And we'll get into that whole ICP development thing in a minute. Um, but with Haloti, um, what they're really trying to push here is simple, concise messaging. I see a ton of folks posting. I'm looking for a rock star this, a wizard that. Um, I know that from, a, from an HR bias standpoint, it kind of sounds cool. Really consider, does my target audience really want to, like, do they really view themselves as a Java superstar or a Java uh, wizard or whatever? 99 times out of 100, they don't. Like, they, they get turned off by that message. So really consider um, which network makes the most sense. I know Rebecca's been kind of pushing me to get on TikTok and... It's just not going to happen. I am I am coordinated like a wounded gazelle, and it's just not going to happen. But it's a scenario where if uh, we were looking for a skill set that primarily lives on Instagram, then we we'd hit Instagram. So although I'm wearing a LinkedIn golf shirt right now, don't think that LinkedIn is your sole channel that you should pay attention to, um, because it really depends on where does my ideal candidate live, work, and play. And that kind of brings us into the whole idea of creating an ideal candidate persona. Um, think of it as how your marketing department would kind of structure their strategy around how do I generate more customers? And they're going to think about, you know, what, what type of company is it, for example? Am I selling to enterprise organizations? Is it SMB? Is it mid-market? Uh, is it independent folks? Um, for recruiting, there's definitely a difference between an early career, a mid career, and a senior career uh, kind of person. So really consider the stage of the career that you feel that person likely is in. Um, and at the same time, is geography an issue? And if it's not, outstanding. It, that, that creates different issues. Um, but if it is something where you're in Toronto and you want someone to work in office uh, when it's safe to do so, et cetera, you're kind of limited to, um, to that, I don't know, hour, hour commute. Um, if you have gone fully remote in Canada or North America in general, um, 
it's, it's, it's a great problem to have, but it also makes advertising a lot harder to make efficient. So there's tons of different boards that you post to around uh, fully remote work or different channels on Twitter or whatever. Um, but having a, a wider uh, uh, available range, a geographical range of where people live, um, it's a blessing and a curse. So if, if you want to drive a hybrid model where they're working from home two or three days a week and they're working in the office two or three days a week, whatever the math works out to be, uh, that's great. Um, but that's something that you need to highlight early on. So candidates aren't getting to the end of the, the, the whole interview process and just find out, oh, you want me to be in the office four days a week. I only want to go in the office once every two weeks sort of thing. Um, so as you're building out your strategy, really think, how does geography impact this company? And if it's, if it's a non-issue, um, that, that turns into a marketing issue. If it, if it is an issue, it turns into a, you're now, you're now competing with the, the local market sort of thing. Um, and at the same time, we kind of touched on this, the internet habits. Where, where do they go online? What do they spend their time doing? Uh, are they on LinkedIn? Is it, is it Instagram? Is it Twitter? Uh, is it TikTok? Um, should you be putting um, uh, a remarketing campaign on your postings or your careers page? Because, you know, the first time someone sees your posting, it's on Indeed, they click on the careers page, but they're not ready to apply yet. Like, when you think about um, what we used to do, it used to be you would go to the office, you'd have a desktop computer, and then you're at your office, you go home, you don't see your computer until the next day. Last, what, 12 years, we've all had laptops, we've all had uh, smartphones, we have all that stuff. So the vast majority of your candidate behavior is probably happening on a mobile device at this point. If that's the case, what are you doing to engage those folks on mobile? And I'm not just talking about optimizing your page, um, but what are you doing to actually follow them? What communities are you building to engage with them? That kind of thing. Um, and then weaknesses. This is something where... Um, again, we've entered this whole new world of work, and it seems like hiring should be easier, but it's not. And what we're dealing with now is a lot of people have kind of lowered their risk tolerance uh, for change. Um, maybe they made it through the pandemic. They've got a great um, benefits package. They have a, a very stable company with stable customers and all that kind of stuff. Um, they're starting to get a little curious about what else is out there. Uh, they haven't necessarily fulfilled the objectives of what you need that person to do in your next role. Maybe it's time to stop looking for perfect candidates and start thinking about objectively, what does this person need to deliver within this team, with what resources, within what time frame, and figuring out what, what stuff is acceptable for them to be missing uh, early on in the process. And what sort of ways can you build out development plans to kind of build those muscles that you need sort of thing. So it's not just about the perfect resume. It's about the perfect scenario for growth and an overall fit in addition to the team. And part of that comes into low level goals. Um, it's not just the low level goals that the company wants to achieve. Um, but what are those areas for growth that the candidate wants to tackle and have access to by joining your team? Um, so it's, it's less about going to the people store and just picking up the perfect person. It's more about, you know, we're in a scenario now where we're competing with literally the whole world. Um, we're, we're figuring out how to work from home full time or live at work, depending on how you put it. Um, what can we do to attract the people that have the capability of, of being successful in our organization? And, and how does that kind of act as a magnet or a draw to them to want to join our company? And how does that growth kind of feed into their high level goals? Maybe they want to become a people manager. Maybe they want to um, go from internal to external and be more customer facing. Maybe they want to go from uh, marketing to customer development or customer, uh, uh, customer product support. Um, so the whole landscape of how we hire has really changed. Um, so it's not just about you know, someone left the role, therefore we need to replace them with a, a carbon copy. It's more about what does my ideal candidate or ideal hire look like, quote unquote? Um, where do they live, work and play? And how can we create an environment where we can get the person at the stage of their career that we feel we need within the geography that we need. Um, we can approach them through the digital channels that make the most sense. We're aware that we, we won't necessarily get a perfect candidate, but here's where we're willing to budge. 
and how does that budge turn into growth, both for the company and for the organization in general? Um, so John, um, before you move on, move on, we had a question. Sure. Um, if I'm not actively hiring right now, but I still need to engage, do I still need to engage and build a community of potential candidates? Does ROI hold up or is it more economical just to pay for ads on LinkedIn when I'm ready to hire? Great question. Can you ask the person the context of their organization? Like, are they a software company? Are they a, like, what, what does the company do high level? Um, and just regardless of, of the response to that, um, it is always better to be always recruiting than turn it into a reactive scenario. So I get hiring managers uh, in general are very reactive. They're busy as hell. They've got 10 different things they're trying to get done every single day. Uh, and if everything seems good, they're probably not thinking about hiring. Um, I think, I, I know I said I didn't want to talk about Amazon and Google and all that stuff, uh, but I'm going to come back to Amazon. Um, Amazon directors are expected to commit at least 20% of their day every day to recruiting for future employees. And the reason being is if you don't have the pipeline of talent before you need them, as soon as you need them, you're already behind. Um, so there are, there's lots of different things that you can do to kind of continuously populate your funnel with net new options uh, and build that relationship with those folks before you need them. Um, if, you, if you just want to be that reactive person and someone quit, or we just want a huge contract, so we need to hire four more people, um, the pain's already there. So you're already behind. So my, my bias is definitely always be recruiting um, and always be building communities of folks that, that kind of gravitate towards the why behind the what. So if your organization is, is tackling, say, for example, we do a lot of work in the, um, or we're starting to do a lot of work in the agricultural world. Um, farmers feed cities. Like if we don't have farmers, then we don't eat, period. So if, if those organizations were waiting you know, for a year to hire their first engineer or hire a, a support person or whatever, uh, there's, there's major business and societal impact to it. So um, being proactive is harder, it's work, uh, but it always pays out better than being reactive as a gross generalization. Rebecca, did we get a response on the context? We did not, but I think you answered most of the questions. We're good. Okay. For, for whoever asked that, if that helped, outstanding. If not, uh, just uh, chime back in. Words in general. Um, so when you're looking at the major impact of all this, I'm saying internet connection is unstable. Can you see me, Rebecca? Yeah, you just, you, you cut out there just very briefly. Sorry about that, I had the notification. Um, so candidate experience is super important. Um, again, you're, you're going to get negative reviews at some point. Um, mitigating that risk as much as you can and providing great experiences to folks uh, in general is the best course of action. If you get those negative reviews or when you get those negative reviews, just acknowledge them and show that you're paying attention. Um, but getting into, you know, you've attracted that person, they've done their homework. Um, now it's time to actually interview them. Um, we were kind of touching on this at the beginning. Uh, lots of folks think they're great interviewers, and I think most are probably not. Um, and this isn't, this isn't trashing HR recruiters. I'm talking about hiring managers who uh, their primary responsibility is not interviewing. It's building product, it's coaching people, et cetera. Um, I think it's really important to go into an interview with a plan, uh, especially when you're a startup. Um, I find in startup hiring in general, it's really easy to kind of gravitate towards the candidates and what they've done and what stood about their profile as opposed to thinking about, you know, what are the objective things that, that I need this hire to deliver uh, to be successful as a company? So one of the biggest things that, that I drive through our client base is number one, is really embedding your organization's values into the interview process. Uh, because at the end of the day, if someone can do the job, but they are not adding to the culture, they don't live through the same ethics, the same morals, all that kind of stuff, it's just not going to be a good fit. Um, so I think from a foundational level, embedding your organization's values into the interview process is probably the most impactful thing you can do um, to ensure the most success in your interview process in general. Um, the second thing is involving your employees in the process. So 
Um, there's all sorts of data that talks about, you know, should we do panel interviews? How many interviews should we have before we make a hire? Um, I've seen organizations interview someone for 20 minutes and put an offer on the table. And I've seen organizations put someone through 10 rounds of interviewing and then the candidate bounces out at the end because it just took too long, that sort of thing. Um, I think involving employees in the process is a, a really easy kind of go between that helps make the interview process much, much more efficient. So instead of doing one interview with John, one with Rebecca, one with Steve, one with Anna, whomever, get, get uh, as many of those group interviews in as you can, but don't overload the candidate. So don't, don't put them in front of six people in a room, like at most three, um, but try and consolidate your interview process as, as much as you can while still getting the information that you need uh, from the candidate and provide your employees with, with interview training, like actual practice time. Um, because there's nothing worse than sending an employee in to interview someone who has no idea what they're doing, um, what the goals are of, of the interview, what the objective kind of scorecard looks like for me for the role. We'll get into that scorecard thing in a second. Um, but actually dedicating a little bit of time for your employees involved in the process to practice their interview uh, 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 capability is absolutely huge. Um, I think a pretty average scenario is at least three rounds per hire, uh, give or take. And if in every round the candidate is asked the same kind of soft skill questions, what you've done is spent three hours of time to really only get 20 minutes of information. So having a plan, having some practice, uh, having, having that interview kind of based in the core stuff that really matters for your company uh, is absolutely huge and will likely increase your overall efficiency uh, if you're not uh, already doing so. Um, just another stat, I forget where this came from, Rebecca, I think this was like a LinkedIn stat. Um, if you're kind of shooting from the hip in the interviewing process, you're basically throwing darts. There's not a whole lot of, of structure. Um, and so you're not necessarily going to get repeatable results. So regardless of the profile that you're looking for, whether it be a sales role, marketing, HR, finance, you name it, um, in with a plan, go in with some structure, uh, do some practice and uh, get the right people uh, involved in the process before it starts. So your employees that are going to get pulled in for a peer interview, they know that it's coming in two weeks. So they have some time and it's not just a last minute thing. Um, Rebecca, I saw another thing pop up in the chat. This is just the scorecard. Should we answer some questions here before we get into the scorecard? Nope, nothing further right now. Nothing further? Fantastic. So this is just a sample scorecard that we've created. Um, that kind of speaks to the whole idea of what, what do we really need in this role? Do I need someone with five years of experience or do I need someone that can deliver a million dollars of revenue with you know, access to these tools within this period of time? Um, so this is something that we can shoot over. If, if you want to kind of take a peek for yourself and see how you can scale out your, your own organization, uh, happy to send it. Um, but basically, this is just a really, really simple uh, checkpoint that you can use to make sure that you're covering the, the stuff that you need to cover to make sure that you objectively know what you're looking for and how you can identify it. And as you'll see, it's pretty straightforward. So it doesn't need to be crazy in depth. Uh, I have seen some organizations have like a five page scorecard that you need an engineering degree just to submit your feedback. That kind of stuff is, is never going to scale. It's just, you may see it, you may implement it, but if you actually look at the data afterwards, I bet you most people don't use it. So when you're doing your scorecarding process, uh, it really comes down to the objective uh, traits that are measurable uh, and making sure that you are asking the questions, creating the environments that give the candidate the opportunity to show that they have it, they don't, or they can learn, that sort of thing. Um, how to win more candidates at the offer stage. This is one of the most frustrating things in the world where you bring a candidate all the way through the process Maybe you head hunted them through LinkedIn. It's been three months of trying to court them, all this kind of stuff. And then you just find out at the very end, uh, they're not accepting your offer. It sucks. It happens. You want to minimize that. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can attack the, tackle this. But the big thing is what I call pre-closing people, pre-closing candidates. Same thing in sales. Don't send out a contract or a proposal unless you know that that other side's going to sign it, that sort of thing. So... Um, similar to uh, grade school, I think I was probably, I don't know, eight or nine years old. Um, Rebecca, I'm going to embarrass you. Um, Rebecca was eight or nine years old. I was eight or nine years old. And you have a crush on your schoolmate. 
um, but you don't have the confidence to actually talk to them. So you write down on that piece of paper, do you like me? Yes, no, maybe. Um, I do this all the time with candidates. Uh, now I'm not saying, do you like me? Yes, no, maybe, but it's the whole idea of, listen, before we move forward to the next step in the process, uh, which would be an offer, here's our evaluation of you thus far. Um, that we think you demonstrated that you're an outstanding fit for this because of that. Uh, and then highlighting actual tangible examples of what they've shared throughout the selection process. Um, here's some areas that we think there's some opportunity for growth. So for example, um, we're growing in Europe. You haven't, uh, you haven't worked in Europe yet. So that's an opportunity where business is just conducted differently. So there's a learning curve, et cetera. Um, we feel that you'd make a great addition to the team because, and then focus more on the soft skill stuff. Uh, and we'd love to kind of pursue an offer with you, but we wanna make sure that if we go through that, that whole kind of hassle of getting HR involved to get the paperwork sorted, we'd wanna have high confidence that this is the right company for you, this is the right job for you, the numbers made sense, et cetera. In the event that we were to offer you this salary, um, what would you think? What would you say? And then shut up. Just let them think, let them talk. Um, and then they would say, oh, well, you know, at the beginning of the process, um, I, I suggested that I wanted $80,000 a year, something like that. But now that I've gotten to know the role of the company, it seems like the job is worth closer to 90 than 80. So I'd be more comfortable with 90. Fair enough. Um, what about uh, timeline? Let's suppose we were to offer you 90. Um, when would you be available to start? And they say, what are we now, September 15th? Yeah, we're September 15th now. Um, and they say, oh, I could start October 1st. Fantastic. And that's where most people stop. Um, one thing I'd really encourage, uh, and this is happening more and more and more, is uh, asking, uh, asking about what's going to happen when you resign on Monday. Let's suppose we give you this offer of 90,000 to start on October 1st, you sign and then resign on Monday. What's going to happen? And again, shut up, let them talk, let them think. And it's very possible that they haven't even considered the counteroffer. It's very possible that they expect a counteroffer. Having the conversation before you actually go through the process is super important because then you can address those challenges and they'll say, oh, well, they'll probably uh, counteroffer me and give me a, you know, throw a bunch of money at me, et cetera. Okay, great. Then what happens? Like, how does that change your thought process? That sort of thing. So the whole idea, uh, I know it's really fun and in recruiting in general, getting the offer out is always like a big rush. You want to get that offer out as fast as you can. You don't want to lose the candidate to another offer, et cetera. But throwing the offer out without doing your due diligence, uh, again, you're throwing darts. You're not having a lot of, you're not going to convert nearly as many of those candidates by actually going through a formal process of pre-closing. And, and really getting those micro commitments along the way and ensuring that the candidate um, can at least acknowledge what the next step could be or what may happen and getting their feedback in general. So pre-closing folks, um, realistically 95% of the offers you put out should be accepted. Uh, there's always gonna be some folks that it just doesn't make sense. Um, but if your offer uh, acceptance rate is below 80, it's probably because you're putting the offers out without actually doing the diligence of closing them before the paperwork gets done. Talked about that. Uh, last poll. From an onboarding perspective, how many of us have a formal onboarding process? I see lots of companies have it. I would love to hear from the companies that have it What's some of the best feedback your new hires have provided and what is included? Can we maybe put some stuff in the chat and just see for the folks that do have a formal onboarding process, what do you think is the best part or best component of that process? Um, Victoria just responded and she said, it's streamlined and all in one place. And what, can you elaborate a little bit? Like, what does that mean? Is that like a digital checklist? Typing. She says it's a platform basically where you enter everything needed before first day, um, computer, uh, bank information, et cetera. Got it. 
Got it. I remember my my first day at Halogen years ago. I think the first three or four hours was in a, a meeting room filling out paperwork, um, and that was fine. Uh, there was another start uh, that day as well. I forget his name now, but uh, it was a very awkward morning where I'm sitting at a desk with a stranger while both filling out tax pages. That's just odd. Um, I think one thing that that we've realized here at Pivot and Edge is that. Um, Having a structured process that allows uh, folks the ability to learn new stuff without necessarily feeling like they're drinking from the fire hose is really important. Um, so certainly you wanna get people up to speed as quick as you can, uh, but having a, a, a good program really does yield uh, better results than just kind of throwing it together. Um, I do find that there's more to onboarding than just the checklist stuff. So I'm a big fan of uh, a buddy system or having a, like a, like a, an onboarding mentor, um, someone that can kind of walk you through the different questions uh, that always come up. Like we're not gonna talk about where's the washroom, where's the lunchroom, et cetera. How do I request vacation, all that kind of stuff. That's all basic stuff. Um, but I think it's really important to have a component of that first day be a bit of a history lesson and a who's who. So, you know, what is your company all about? Um, what does the, the ideal customer look like for the company? What, what sort of challenge does our product solve? Who are the key players in the business? Uh, what are the, uh, where are the lines of, uh, of the matrix and how do they intersect? Like which, which group works with which group? Who, who do I need to speak with to, to learn about this, learn about that? Um, so having a good onboarding program in general, it can really increase retention by a lot because if you give people a good first impression um, that's, that's a lot better than giving them a bad one. Uh, the last thing you want to do is insert doubt on day one. Rebecca, I saw you were about to say something. We have a ton of people responding in the chat. A lot of people saying that they have, make sure that they're, they're meeting the right people. Um, Samantha came in and said that she uses a platform called a board that manages okay. the entire life cycle of the new hire. So that's maybe something. Um, a little bit different, um, you know, a lot of people saying that there's a lot of structure to the first couple of weeks or first week, at least of what they're expected to do and yep. who they're expected to talk to. So it looks like a lot of people have very good processes in place. That's awesome. Is, does everyone, so for the folks that do have the onboarding process, when does onboarding stop? Like, is it a two week thing? Is there a three month check-in? Is there a, like, at what point does onboarding kind of convert to performance management? Actually, Michaela just chimed in uh, before you asked that, but she said one of her favorite onboarding experiences is being invited to a social bef the Friday before her first day. So, oh, cool. yeah. That's a great idea. And how, how has onboarding changed since we started working from home? Like for the folks that have these programs, um, certainly uh, bigger companies have more resources they can send out with a whole box full of uh, hoodies and, and glasses and books and headphones and all that stuff. But how, how has the onboarding process changed for everyone uh, since the pandemic started and we started working from home? We have a lot of people responding with the timeline. So, you know, after about three months for Samantha, yep. it stops. Um, Rebecca chimed in and said that they have a 30, 60, and 90 day plan. That's a good one. A little bit staging there. Um, Hillary chimed in and said she has a one month check in, a two month check in, and a three month check in. So, just okay. a little bit of uh, so. Yeah. Overall, that's great. Um, building the onboarding program, it sounds like everyone kind of sees the value in that. Um, certainly from a human perspective, you want them to feel engaged. You want them to feel valued. You want them to kind of understand where they sit in the organization in general. So it sounds like that's that's a, something where we're all aligned, which is awesome. Um, what are we curious of? Like certainly uh, working in the startup world, we don't have the same resources that big companies have. Um, but uh, just in terms of what you were hoping to learn uh, by coming into this versus what, what were we missing? Like, what, what are some questions that folks have? And we can, I think we've got another 10 minutes or five minutes or so. We've got eight minutes. Um, what, uh, what can we do to uh, solve some problems for you? We, we did have a question, and so I apologize, Samantha, I didn't see it at the time uh, regarding uh, going back to the glass door um, yes. chat. So she says, do you have any recommend recommendations for how to word the request to employees for writing honest reviews while active in the company? She knows if not done right, it can seem like you're forcing employees to say something nice. Yep. Uh, and it was Samantha, you said? Yes. So Samantha, this is something where I would not recommend you send it to them. I recommend this is a conversation um, that their direct manager have with them. 
Um, and it would be something around the lines of, and, and realistically, if it's with an employee that you're having a challenge with, or you know is disengaged or et cetera, probably not the right candidate or the right to employee to, to poke uh, in, in terms of writing review. Um, if it is a, an employee that the manager knows is engaged, there's a lot of trust built in that relationship between the two. Um, the, the conversation um, that I'd suggest is something along the lines of, hey, employee, whatever, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to hire, we're, we're kind of struggling pulling in more candidates for the marketing role, the development engineering role, et cetera. Um, I know that uh, lots of folks are looking at us on Glassdoor to, to kind of get a gauge for what the employee experience is like, et cetera. Um, in the event that you'd be comfortable leaving us a review with your uh, candid thoughts and opinions about the experience we provide you as an employee, uh, that would be awesome. Um, as soon as you put it in an email and kind of make it directive, uh, it doesn't matter if your employees are engaged or not. There's going to be a, a component of them that just view it or read it uh, more in the, the negative way. Um, so this is not something that I'd recommend you scale out in an all-staff email. Um, make it as personal as possible and, and leverage the, the best relationship to deliver that message in, in a most one-on-one -on -one capacity or, or, or capability uh, uh, as possible. So maybe it's a Zoom call, maybe it's a phone call, whatever the normal is for the manager employee. Um, but it's not something that I'd suggest you do through an email. We, uh, she said, amazing, super helpful. Thanks, John. Awesome, no problem. Uh, we had a question come in from Rebecca, a different Rebecca, not me. <laughs> um, we've implemented a lot of the great strategies you've mentioned today, but we're still struggling to attract top talent for specific roles in engineering. We have a lot of entry-level candidates applying for our senior level job postings. Any yep. strategies for attracting more senior candidates to a small company? Absolutely. And I think, I think that is a challenge that most tech organizations are facing. There's always an endless supply of new grads. Um, new grads are great. We, we, we were all new grads ourselves at one point, but bringing in more seasoned uh, capability is a challenge everyone's facing. Um, specifically when you're talking about top talent, you'll hear people talk about a 10X engineer or a 5X engineer. The reality is, is engineers at the top of their game are not applying to jobs because they're sitting at their job, being amazing, doing awesome stuff. Um, one of the best ways to actually get their attention is to make yourself visible to them in a context and means that is relevant to them, not you. So if, for example, you're approaching them saying, we're looking for a superstar engineer, and you send that message through an email on LinkedIn, they're ignoring you. 99 times out of 100, they're ignoring you. If, for example, you create a technical blog and you can start openly talking about the technical challenge that your team is solving and what the impact is, what the market is, what the context was around how you came to the solution, certainly not asking you to give up any IP or anything like that, um, but top end engineers. Um, are, are more elusive and you really need to get more in the mindset of what is, what is this person going to pay attention to and why should they want to pay attention to our company? And so the, the, it is a longer term play. This is not a, a magic bean scenario, um, but a technical blog that showcases what is the actual technical challenge that your organization is solving and why should other engineers care is the best long-term strategy that you can do that doesn't cost you a whole lot of money. Like certainly you could, um, you know, throw a ton of money through an advertising campaign, et cetera, but you're just gonna get more of those early career types and less of those ideal folks. Um, you, you really need to get your mindset around why should the engineer pay attention to us? Uh, not how can I get the attention of the engineer? Uh, awesome, thanks John. Oh, I love the idea about the technical blog. Thank you. We just had one last question come in uh, just right for the last few minutes here. So Michaela asked, how important is small talk in the interview or what questions do you ask to determine if a candidate is right for your company's culture? Yeah, that's a great question. So small talk is, I think is, is um, I think that's kind of a personal, personal preference. Like um, there, there's lots of different styles of recruiting and interviewing and that kind of stuff. Some folks are more structured. They have the 10 questions and they say, I'm going to ask you 10 questions and submit your, your responses into my system. And then I'll come back to you in a week and let you know. 
Um, other folks like me are far more conversational. Um, one thing that happens all the time is you, you start the conversation and, and inevitably it's, hi, Rebecca, how are you today? And you say, great, how are you? Um, for me, that's an opportunity to lower uh, barriers as quickly as possible. So I'll typically say something like, well, do you want the truth or do you want the generic? I'm fine. And then it always turns into, oh, that's weird. Uh, I, I, I'd like to know the truth. And then I'll say, oh, I had this for breakfast and my cat did that and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, wrestling's on tonight, so I'm excited for that. And it just changes the landscape of the conversation immediately. It's, it's, it's I find that, that kind of lowering those barriers straight away uh, turns into a more fruitful conversation. But I also know that most people don't have my personality. I'm not suggesting that my way is the right way. Um, it's just the way that I do it. Um, the, the, the questions around culture, can you, can you repeat the question around culture, Rebecca? Was it types of questions to ask? Yes, what, what questions can you ask to determine if the candidate is right for the culture? Okay, so there's, there's a culture fit and there's a culture add. So there's two distinct things here. Um, if, if you're looking for someone that fits exactly into the culture that you have right now, it's more about contextual based questions around uh, why they did what they did and, and um, how they did it. So was it a, an individual contributor thing? Was it a collaborative uh, thing? Um, but what was driving the behavior in the first place? So bring it back to the values uh, and don't, don't ask a leading question like at Rebecca Co, um, customer experience is our number one value. Um, at your organization, how, is, how important is providing a great experience to your customers to you? Like that kind of stuff is nonsense. Um, but asking questions that can kind of showcase to you the, 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 the why behind the what. So this was the output that I did. Here's how I did it. But help me understand why you did it that way. Um, can, can kind of showcase what their overall values are and how that can fit into your existing organization. In terms of adding to the culture versus fitting into the culture, um, there's a lot of organizations in transition right now where what they've done uh, in the past is, is no longer working and they need more they need more urgency, they need more grit, they need more collaboration, et cetera. Um, the, 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 the whole thought process around how to, how to discover that during the interview process is the exact same process. Um, really driving down um, into questions that showcase the, the behavioral kind of motivations of their activity. Um, but really consider, am I looking for a culture fit or am I looking to add to the culture and bring in a skill set that we don't necessarily have? Wonderful. Yeah, Donna agrees with you. She loves a good small talk. <laughs> there you go. I think that's all the questions we have to answer right now. We're good. Well, listen, it's uh, that hour went by fast. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for, for coming. If you have any questions, feel free anytime. Um, I think our ebook that kind of summarizes all this, but much more detail automatically gets sent. Rebecca? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. So uh, you should see the ebook um, in your inbox probably as soon as I hit stop sharing and close the webinar. Um, shortly after. <laughs> shortly after. Not, not necessarily instantaneously, but within a few hours. Yeah. Um, feel free to reach out anytime if we can be of help. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for attending. Have a great uh, rest of the week. And everyone, if you haven't already seen it, watch the Geico Camel commercial on Wednesday. It's hilarious. And have a great rest of the day.